Okay, Tokyo, thank you for、uh, speaking at this event. I have already introduced you、uh, in Japanese language at the beginning of the event, but I would like to share with you again why we invited you here today.、Uh, in the first place,、uh, Kayen would not have been possible without Specialist Tana. I still vividly remember when I learned about Specialist Tana's business model through the academic paper.、Uh, it was late at night. Uh, in a bedroom in Evanston, Illinois,、uh, 13 years back or 14 years back. And I was reading papers and websites until dawn and decided to travel to Denmark to meet you.、Uh, since then, multi multiple companies and organizations around the world have started up、uh, with Special Stana as a role model, including us, Cayenne. And Special Stana and you have been at the forefront of this movement. Promoting the One Million Jobs Project. Today, I would like to start by asking you to deliver a speech about, firstly, the story of Specialist Tana,、uh, why you studied, or、uh, how you grew the organization, etc. And secondly, the intention and current status of the One Million Jobs Project with the United Nations and other organizations. And finally,、uh, your expectations regarding Japan and Asia on this issue. And after that, we would be happy if you would take、uh, 40 or 50 minutes、uh, to answer the question we have received in advance. And I have to note that this event holds、uh, 10 sessions, including this keynote speech. And this one is by far the most popular session. And so Japanese people are very eager to hear you. So、uh, we in Japan are thrilled to be able to hear your voice、uh, for the first time. Now I would like to hand the microphone over to you. Tokyo, please. Well, thank you so much,、uh, Kaisa. It's, it's、um, such a privilege to be able to address the Japanese audience to discuss what can we do to create more inclusive work environments so everyone can get a chance to contribute. I do also remember our first interaction. Kaisa,、uh, I just looked up, it was I received the first email from you in June 2008. And,、uh, and it was like、um, a soulmate from Japan, actually based in the US, contacted me. So I felt like a global citizen. And,、um, <clears throat> and I think you were just like me.、Uh, you were. Dedicated, you you had seen a hope, you had a dream, just like I had when when I started. So it was a pleasure to to have you visiting our office in September in 2008 and learn about your dream and discuss how can we support each others. So thanks so much, Kaisa. It 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 has it's a dear memory、uh, to me. I started as so many others do with、um, a family experience.、Uh, I had a traditional career in、uh, IT when my youngest son was diagnosed、uh, with autism at the age of three. I learned about autism. I learned about our Danish welfare system, <clears throat> which is very good, but still 80%. To 90% of autistic people are unemployed.、Um, many struggle to get、uh, a good education, and,、um, and there's a high risk for autistic kids to be bullied and excluded、uh, in the school system. And the more I learned about my own son、um, and the way the Denmark、uh, worked, The more I found that、um, we need to do something,、uh, the balance is not there. We should、um, invite、uh, autistic people into the workplace, into the school system, because they are good people. They have talent, they are honest, they are straightforward.、Uh, they can create a better. Atmosphere in the classroom and in the workplace. So, why are we excluding them? And、uh, I 
decided to try to see can we change uh, the way we do things in Denmark, uh, where most resources are spent on training autistic people to behave like non-autistic people so they can fit in somewhere in the school system or in the labor market. Instead, we should turn around and change the school system and the labor market instead to be able to understand and accommodate autistic people and celebrate the power of people being different uh, to make use of each other's very different perspectives and talent. And this is when I founded uh, Specialistene, Danish for the specialists. We wanted to create um, a new entry to the labor market for those who are not generalists. Um, and have all the favors as generalists do in the labor market with requirement of a lot of social skills. So there must be a need for talent that does not come with, with uh, extended social skills, but they're just very good at what they do and loyal to the workplace and dedicated to the, to the job. So that was in 2004 when I started Specialistina. And um, very fast, soon I found out that if it worked in Denmark, it would have an appeal globally. I was contacted by people, very often parents um, from more than 100 countries who said, if, if it works in Denmark, you, you need to come and help us here. Um, a professor, Rob Austin, came by and wrote a case study for Harvard Business School. I think this is actually where you, Kata, <laughs> read about us the first time. And suddenly we were a case at Harvard Business School. And um, I attended um, the case presentation at Harvard Business School and received a standing ovation from 70 MBA students. And that really gave me a courage to set a high goal to say, if, if we would make a change, we need to make brave, set brave goals and declare um, an ambition, not just for a few hundred jobs, but for 1 million jobs. Because in order to achieve 1 million jobs, you had to work on changing mindsets, making people aware of what can be done and encourage people to take action around the world. So even though Denmark is a small country with 6 million people, um, <laughs> we, we can set high goals like 1 million jobs. But um, um, my board of directors told me that um, I need to move, relocate to the US for some years to see if we can get the big American companies to want to employ autistic people um, because there's so much power in big companies. They can change attitudes in, um, in the sector, in the labor market, in governments. Um, so we, we have to see if we can get the big companies to, to employ uh, autistic people by the hundreds. So in 2013, I relocated with my family to the US and we started working with big companies. The first big one was SAP who committed to hundreds of jobs around the world, um, followed by Microsoft, IBM, many big banks. So suddenly there was a momentum. And I was um, invited by the United Nations to um, co-create um, a theme at the UN World Autism Awareness Day about the advantage of hiring uh, autistic people. We did 
the theme at the UN event in 2015, and that really stimulated um, the interest from large companies around the world. Um, we are, today we are associated with the United Nations Department of Global Communications, so it's it's part of of my my work to address audiences around the world. So this is a great opportunity for me. Thanks again, Kaita. What we have found is that um, the big companies they hire not because of social responsibility, but because the people, the autistic people that are employed, they do a good job. They live up to the expectations of the vacant job. Um, and secondly, they create a better work environment. A workplace where autistic people thrive is a better workplace. That has been documented by Professor Rob Austin. Co-workers are more engaged. They care more about each other's. They are uh, engaging in more activities in the workplace. Um, because there are so many who know autistic people or people with ADHD or dyslexia or uh, similar conditions, that means that they face barriers in the school system and the workplace, just like autistic people do. Today, we have a term, we call them neurodivergent people, those who are not the typical generalists, but are outside um, um, the processes that are designed for the employees in the organization. Um, but autistic people may represent one to two percent of the world's population. ADHD may be three to five percent, dyslexia even more. So out of a general population, maybe 15% or so have a lot of talent, but are not understood or misunderstood in the workplace. And we have to change that together. We, we have to give the workplaces the opportunity to address and harvest all talent in the local community. That's the third finding by Professor Rob Austin. Uh, companies, workplaces where autistic people thrive are workplaces where all co-workers are more proud of their company. Um, they are, the companies are more attractive to the future workforce and, um, um, and in a community with uh, very low unemployment rates, it's important that you are among the most attractive companies for the talent in your community. And a good way to be that is to make sure to include neurodivergent persons in the workplace. So um, we have the proof from so many big companies that it's of business value to hire autistic uh, people. And um, today, specialist is in 14 countries. So we have experience from around the world. And we are so lucky that there are a lot of organizations like Cayenne who have uh, started something similar, inspired by us. So that's part of our strategy to inspire people, uh, to start similar organizations or inspire companies to do something similar. Um, so uh, I think it's, it's a very good movement that takes place. In Asia, we have been, um, well, we, we have been uh, uh, operating specialist in Australia um, for many years, Asia Pacific. Um, I've been to China and to Indonesia and to India to do Autism Advantage luncheons. We recently started up in, in India. 
but I must say I, I've not been to Japan yet. But um, I do think that um, what I understand from the Japanese labor market is that it's typically very large corporations and with a tradition of, of lifelong employment. So I think this is a very good basis for talking about inclusion of neurodivergent persons uh, because corporations are so important for the, the local community and the national community in Japan. There's also um, a low unemployment rate and an aging population. So Japan needs all available talents in the local community as I see it. And there's so much untapped talent among autistic people and neurodivergent people that I think um, um, I think Japanese companies should just run to Kayan and similar organizations and see how can they be helped to understand and manage neurodivergent persons better. And in Japan and in Asia, this is where the majority of the world's population is. So it will be important to my one million job goal to, to <clears throat> if we can become uh, very active and see how the impact grow in Japan and Asia. So I hope this was um, um, uh, gave some background for the concept and the hopes for changing the world. Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, uh, when, when you mentioned uh, uh, our memory of 2008, I, I overscribed. <laughs> uh, it, it was very uh, memorable at the time and uh, changed my life. So uh, you and specialist that I gave uh, the meaning uh, to my life. Thank you so much. Thank so, you. Uh, so then I uh, move forward. Uh, now we, we have received many questions in advance from the Japanese viewers. So uh, let's let's ask Tokyo one by one. Uh, so so many uh, Japanese audience want to know about the world. So in Japan, the term and the concept of neurodiversity are not yet sufficiently widespread or used. So how about Europe and the United States? how much uh, people with neurodiversity accept in general? Yes, yeah, so um, I think in particularly in North America, um, there's um, um, the self-advocates, those who are neurodivergent are very um, uh, uh, outspoken and very advanced in making their voices heard. And this is so important for, for the whole movement. Um, so the term neurodiversity was actually um, founded by an autistic person who kind of say, I, I may have um, autism spectrum disorder, maybe in combination with attention deficit hyperactivity disorder but let's let's not talk so much about disorders and disabilities because i'm just a human like everyone else and there's been people have been different all throughout history through generations we we need those who are generalists we need those who are specialists we need those who um, can do steady work on a daily basis. We need those who may be more, um, um, have a shorter attention span and, and maybe think differently, think out of the box and come up with ideas and perspectives that can enrich our, our labor market. But what I've seen in my generation is that the labor market has con concentrated more and more. You, you need to have a, um, a generalist profile um, because that 
that is what most companies have, um, have prepared their processes and procedures around in HR recruitment and in management. So I think we are getting more and more narrow in what is our idea of an kind of ideal employee. But as we do that, we, we sort out so much talent that we could also have brought into our company. And I think our way of thinking um, is um, from an old uh, way of thinking where it was very much about uh, industry, it was about production, and uh, we favored uh, that things should be the same uh, all the time. But now we are in an, in an innovation phase where it's, um, we are competing in a global knowledge-based economy. And if you only do this, the same all the time, your competitors will beat you up soon. This is, um, to be an innovative company, you have to have people who think differently. And, um, and this is why so many companies today are interested in see how can we expand our processes from the narrow focus on generalist to, to also include in principle, all talent in the local community. Um, I think this, this um, movement is, is uh, growing very much in the Western world. Companies are now also, they started up with, um, with hiring programs for autistic people. Now they want to go into uh, hiring programs for neurodivergent people. So also to include people with ADHD, um, OCD, dyslexia, and, and so on. But the main message um, when talking about neurodiversity is that um, we that people with uh, who are neurodivergent they are not um, they are not less than neurotypical people they are just as valuable and it's it's really up to the workplace to create the environment where everyone can excel. So I don't know what the status is in, in Japan for this movement, but I think it's, it's coming, it's growing in, in the West and it's a very much needed move, movement because we should spend more effort on in, including people than excluding people. Okay, thank you. Uh, so I, I want to add something uh, to the first question. I mean, uh, even in uh, Northern Europe countries, uh, for example, I hear many news, for example, anti-immigrant movements or so. So I, I think the world uh, in another way, uh, is becoming somewhat less acceptable now. So do such movements affect people with ASD and ADHD? Do you feel that kind of that division of the world? I don't, uh, I, I don't think so, but, but you're right. Uh, I think the world as such is heading in the wrong direction of people being uncomfortable with people who are different than themselves. And I think the, the migration um, example is, is a good example of that. Um, but um, I think we can make our contribution uh, by saying that this is the benefits you can get from including one part of the population, uh, your divergent persons. But um, I do, I do, also think that we are, as a society, uh, we are heading the wrong way. We are, um, um, there's, there's a drive to being the popular ones. Um, 
and um, and not not to kind of um, uh, st stick out from from groups and so on. And um, I think we we can make a small contribution in that to say uh, it's much better to include than to exclude. Okay, thank you so much. So the next question is kind of expertise of the special Western and many people are, are eager to know. So what are secrets or ingredients of the special Western? So how does the special Western implement neurodiversity in the workplace? Or more specifically, to what extent uh, do, do you set the environment or tasks or salary level and so on? I think um, <clears throat> The secret is that we believe in autistic people and neurodivergent people. <clears throat> and we know that you can only thrive in the workplace if you feel comfortable. So we need to make everyone comfortable. We need to make the company comfortable, the managers, the co-workers comfortable. And so we introduce um, uh, what it would entail to, to bring autistic or neurodivergent persons into the workplace. Um, we also work to establish and expand the comfort zone of the individual, the autistic person, uh, because many have never been in a workplace before or if they had been in a workplace, it may have been a bad uh, experience. Or they may have been, been fired or, or so. So we need to slowly build the comfort zone to make people comfortable because only when you're comfortable, you can show um, what you're capable of and what contribution you can make to the company. So I think the first secret source is to believe. The, the second is, um, to play, to, to create environments where people think they are playing, but they are actually showing us a lot about themselves. Um, and this is why we have, for example, used um, Lego Mindstorms robots for a long time um, uh, to do advanced stuff, give some challenges to, to work on, individually or together with others. But um, we, we have to create these uh, settings where you want to interact with others and where you can show rather than tell about your personality and, and, and skills and, and way of communicating and what, what kind of management um, is optimal for you. So I think um, the biggest change from before I started specialist on it is that, that <clears throat> we focus on the inclusive environment and then we prepare both uh, the autistic person and the workplace to kind of have a comfort zone together. Thank you. So uh, do, do you hire some uh, autism specialist or ADHD specialist? Yes. So um, our aim is uh, to get autistic persons working. And, <clears throat> and um, if employers want um, the arrangements where specialist and is the employer and then the company will rent services from specialist and uh, um, produced by autistic persons then we uh, we establish a consultancy model um, in other cases we help the company to hire um, autistic persons or your diverting persons so um, we we see inclusion as uh, a model with more steps. Uh, we need to find the step where 
um, the company is comfortable. And it may be we, we start with saying, you can buy the services. We, we take care of all the, the, the management uh, stuff, the HR stuff. Over time, when you have gotten uh, used to um, the quality of, of the work of autistic persons, we can help you employ them afterwards. And we can help you with reviewing the processes uh, in your HR department or career development part, department where, where you may have some processes and procedures who are excluding uh, your direct in persons. Um, so inclusion is, is a journey and you have to find the step you're comfortable with and then move towards um, a, a workplace that is as inclusive for all kinds of people. So, um, but specialist and is different in, in all countries. So um, in, in some countries, we have more weight on the consultancy model where specialist and is uh, often the employer. In other countries, we focus more on helping <clears throat> companies directly to employ. Thank you. And for the first time, ah, uh, so when I read the articles of the specialist, Anna, uh, my, I would say, I was so shocked that, you, you know, software testing uh, seems like the best job uh, for the people with autism. But uh, when I, you know, trained many people, the so software testing is not the only solution for them. So, but, but many people believe that, you know, IT or tech industry uh, is, is one of the best uh, have say jobs for uh, most neurodivergent, neurodivergent into individuals. So what do you think about the occupation of the industry? Uh, so which industry or uh, professions are suitable for people with neurodivergent? That's a very good point, uh, Kaita. <clears throat> and I think this impression of autistic people being very well suited for IT jobs, such as uh, software testing, also comes from the fact that many of, of the first big clients were very much in the tech industry. But um, today we, we, we have experience from cyber security to pig farming. So one of the one of the jobs that I'm most fond of is uh, the jobs we have been helping to create in pig farming in Australia. So many autistic uh, people they love to to be with animals, and maybe they have a cat or a dog, or but they have not seen um, this as a career opportunity, but. In pig farming, uh, there is a career opportunity, and um, it, it's very good to have people, um, autistic people, who are just so fond of of working with animals, who have an attention to detail, who can see if some of the pigs are, are not feeling well, or or if there's some pattern that they need some extra care or concern. Um, and they are very structured. They um, and have an eye on, on detail, and they have brought in so much joy of work in the agriculture industry in in Australia. So I think um, everything is possible from pig farming to cybersecurity. We have also experience from. Um, yeah, I think maybe more than a hundred different job descriptions. Um, so for us, software testing was just a starting point to demonstrate one example of what can be done. But I, I often claim that at least five percent of all tasks in any industry, uh, in any organization would be a very good fit for autistic people. 
And if I'm right, then it's just a matter of, of uh, trying things out. Um, and if 5% of all tasks are at least are very well suited for autistic people, then it should not be a problem if one or 2% of the population uh, is autistic. Um, but uh, I think that there's nothing that's impossible. Even um, many also believe that autistic people should not be front end people uh, engaging directly with customers and clients. But we do also have very good experience in that field with um, autistic people being trained as hosts for um, um, a museum or um, a tourist attraction. Because autistic people are so concrete, they are very um, curious, they are caring, they, they, they want to inform and to do it in a proper way. Um, so we, we have good experience also in back office, front office, um, many different industries. But the, the most um, um, visible cases have been with big IT companies, with big financial companies. Now we are working to see how can small companies, medium-sized companies in all industries benefit from from the talents of neurodivergent persons. Because um, also small companies with maybe less than 10 employees um, should, should, be, um, should be potential employers of, of neurodivergent persons. Uh, so this is, this is our ambition. Also to work with the, the education system to get inclusion working already in the education system so that the transition into employment um, will not be uh, as difficult as today. Thank you. So you have already mentioned about the uh, education system. And I know that you, you know Denmark is very, very famous for advanced uh, education system and uh, uh, I would say principles. So I want to know that uh, what, what is your opinion on education for uh, people with uh, neurodivergent, uh, neurodiversity? So to grow a kid to a good candidate for an employee, what do, you, what do we bear in mind as a teacher or as a parent or as a supporter? Um, this is one of my favorite questions, Kaita, because if we if we want inclusion to work in the labor market we need to have inclusion working in the school system um, and mostly because neurotypical people those who who <laughs> fit in <laughs> who are um, um, the generalist in the companies if they do not meet neurodivergent persons in the school system, they may have this fear of the unknown when they get into the labor market. And then when they hire people, they hire those that they, they know of um, and not the ones that where they are unsure how to, to manage. Um, so we need to, to have classrooms just as the workplace excel in inclusion. Um, there's so much that neurodivergent kids can add of, of value, but today they are not being allowed. Uh, um, they are often uh, separated into special tracks to special schools, which is, is uh, good and needed for many, but just as inclusion in the workplace, you have to start somewhere and then you have to grow your comfort zone and, and become more and more included in, in the whole setting. So this should also be the ambition of every school, I think, to have 
um, an opportunity for your know, working kids to to find their comfort zone, to grow it, and with the aim that the whole class should be one uh, inclusive community. We have um, a school in Denmark, a three-year youth education in Specialistene, where we have three years to, to work with autistic um, adolescents between 16 to 25 years of age, where we also train life skills and, um, and, and social skills and professional skills. And um, we have a good success rate in, um, in inclusion in further education or in the workplace afterwards. But um, it's so important that kids, they have, they get the time they need to find their comfort zone and grow it together with others, not, not to on, not to be alone somewhere where they do not, uh, um, where they are not part of uh, a social a local community. We have also done a project with support by the Lego Foundation on how can we use our experiences from inclusion in the labor market um, to, to um, include kids down to uh, primary school age in mainstream classes in uh, the, the general school system. And um, we have evidence that it can be done. And in particular, play is, is the most important part to believe in people and to play with people. That works in the labor market and it also works in the school system. Uh, th thank you. So in Japan, there is a, a big, how say, debate about which, which is better. I mean, uh, inclusion school or the uh, schools uh, for special needs. So, what what do you think about the best way uh, for people uh, for kids uh, with autism and ADHD? I think that, that the answer would be it depends, <laughs> but. Uh, Please tell us the, your answer. Yes, it depends. And it's probably a combination because um, we also, um, autistic people, they also need um, a comfort zone if, if, uh, if they are being stressed in the workplace or in the school system, they, they, had to be able to withdraw to kind of a safe environment while they rebuilt their comfort zone so they can come back and act again. And I think if we could have a system where the aim is inclusion in the general school system in, in classrooms, but we have a special uh, uh, school system in order to establish the comfort zones so that they can get into the mainstream classes, but also as a fallback, because um, we, we, we need to, to grow your comfort zone, you also need to challenge your comfort zone. So there will be cases where not just autistic or neurodivergent people, but it's the same for, for everyone also. Everyone needs to grow through expanding of comfort zones. And when I see the statistics of mental health issues in Denmark, I can surely say that it's not just autistic people or neurodivergent people who are challenged in the school system and who can benefit from more inclusion. So I think um, a classroom where autistic neurodivergent persons are included is a much better classroom for, for everyone. Also for the teacher um, and um, 
and a, a place where talent are, and motivations are being worked upon. Um, it's also a benefit for the labor market and society as a whole. But I think the discussion you are referring to takes place in, in all countries in the world. Um, and I, I would encourage all school systems to, to, to reconsider and see what kind of combinations will be available instead of either inclusion or special schools. Thank you. Uh, so I think it's a good time to move uh, to the final note. So uh, again, thank you for answering uh, our uh, various questions. And I am sure everyone uh, here gained a lot of strength from uh, hearing specialist Anna's story uh, from uh, Tokyo for the first time, uh, uh, which will help us uh, in the future parenting and activities. And Kaya want to continue to work with specialist Anna to expand the path to uh, independence and employment uh, for people with neurodiversity. Uh, so with that, uh, finally, uh, Tokyo, I would like to have a final message uh, from you uh, to the Japanese audience. Yes, thank you, and Thank you, Kaita, for this opportunity. I'll just say that um, I'm very impressed with what Kayan has been, been achieving over the years. Um, uh, thanks to you, Kaita, and your team and your partners and, and your network, change cannot come from individuals. It, it has to be by, by the many, by everyone. So I would encourage everyone to, to join the movement and to support Kaita and Kayan and, and, and benefit from the opportunity that is there. There's so much untapped talent that, um, that deserves and needs uh, to be included and can add so much business value to the labor market, to families, to the communities. So I would encourage everyone to, to join the movement. And thanks for this opportunity, Kaita. Thank you. Um... So Japan is now losing kind of confidence uh, because our economy is shrinking and <laughs> our population is shrinking, but still we have a lot of people, especially compared to, for example, Denmark, and we have a, a world leading company still. So we have may, maybe tons of uh, things to do uh, to, to help people with autism, or maybe, uh, how do I say, tap into the talents of people with uh, neurodiversity. And uh, I think that uh, you have never been to Japan. So I would like to invite you to Japan next time in person. And, uh, or uh, we would make a healthy tour, especially stand-up tour uh, in the near future to, to visit and see the actual sites uh, of the specialist stand-up. And- That would be fantastic. Right. Right. So thank you for your time. And uh, we are looking forward to meet you again. Thank you. Thanks.